But I'm happy to introduce uh, Sister Mickey Mangan, one of the greatest little ladies I've ever known. She has talent with consecration. She has ability with character. And uh, she has blessed our fellowship through the years, always in the background. And when she's needed, she just steps up and does her job and does it well and is anointed. She loves people. She has a great love for the work of God. She loves this city. She loves this church. She loves all of us. And she has something from the Lord for us today. I'm glad that Mickey's going to be speaking to us. God bless you, honey. Come on and give us whatever the Lord has given us.
There's a lovely story of a bird named Jonathan Livingston Siegel. It tells of his freedom. It tells of his survival. They made a film from the book and with great interest I read about the filming, how the effects were done. Most of the shots that were filmed were taken of Jonathan as he was in flight, soaring and gliding in such beauty and in such liberty. But in actuality, though the viewer could not see, he was tied to a perch by strings. It was an invisible string. He only appeared to be free. The strings that bind us to our Christian reputation are so strong. Just as the seagull were tied, tied to things, tied to concerns, important as they well may be, but we are so attached to them that they have control over us. Yet don't we give the appearance of freedom? It was the second week of January this year. My very dear and admired friend, Phyllis Nordstrom, asked me in the midst of Nelson's third birthday party, Mickey, what day belongs to just you? When and where do you go and regroup? Well, immediately I had to find something. I had to find some answer for the sake of that which I've identified myself with for so long. A very extremely busy person, yet never ruffled. You see, the outside of me goes to church and sings in the choir and it plays the organ, runs a bus route, it attends every baby shower, wedding shower, home Bible study meetings, prayer meetings, goes to the hospital, nursing homes, visits the shut-ins, takes part in community service, donates blood, writes notes. I'm a carpool mom. I say hi to my husband now and then. I fix a meal if there's time, take my children to the park if there's time, visit my 87-year-old grandmother if there's time, and laughs with my sister if there's time. Whatever answer I gave you, Phyllis, it wasn't true. Because you see, I have the feeling that if I work harder and longer and give more of myself, that I will in time achieve at last a sense of maturity, a sense of accomplishment. And most certainly I'm going to gain the confidence and the approval of people. The Pharisees did. They dressed themselves up as God's champions made sure that their deeds were seen by men. Were they visible? They loved the place of honor at the feast. They loved the best synagogues. They loved to be seen in the best seats. Matthew said that they adored salutations and they loved being called rabbi. What a performance of spirituality. Oh, bless you, Sister Mickey. What a worker you are. You just can't seem to do enough for the kingdom of God. Yes, my calendar is jammed with good things to do. Really, Phyllis, I'm not much different than those Pharisees. How I act on the outside can quite often be likened to a performance. The stage is set, and the scene 
It's always the same scene. Lasts and lasts until the actor drops from total empty exhaustion. Oh, I know that outward manifestations are important. I learned all of this from my own mom and dad. Visibility is a great strength. Much is taught, much is learned by the power of example. It's just that from time to time, in my moments of burned out emptiness, I realize that outward manifestations can never take the place of my inward manifestations. What we contain is much more than what we are. There he was just waiting in our old familiar place. Oh, how I remember Knoxville, Iowa. The hardwood floor and me flat on my back, speaking in tongues for the very first time. You were there, Mom. Only seven years old, but I was allowed to experience that awesome feeling. I can still remember the frustration of trying to reveal what had just happened to me. It was so big. It was so magnificent. But I tried so hard to make him fit into the fulfillment and into the joy that I was feeling. But I couldn't say it. I couldn't explain it good enough. Maybe it was there that I realized that life in Jesus Christ is so internal that it can't be externalized completely. Why did I forget that? How did I complicate the simplicity of that revelation at such a young age? Maturity came. And along with it came achievement and accomplishment. There's no doubt that the historical facts of Christ are clear. And certainly the biblical truths are sure. But the reality of Jesus Christ is always a matter of the heart. Inwardness is where we and the Lord meet. It is there that the union is made. A oneness is born out of two hungers. I hunger for Him and He longs for me. There have been times that I wanted God just as desperately as I did that night on the cold floor. But in my pursuit of trying to find Him, He became Him. He keep it, it was invisible. God, where are you? And all along, He was so near to me that I didn't see Him. Why? Inwardness was the last place I looked. An empty spot beside Him where once I used to wait to be filled with strength and wisdom were His vessels. God created us to be receptacles of Himself thereby allowing Him a place to live. But in spite of His readiness to invade our lives, some of us hold nothing. Our inner man created by God to contain Himself holds nothing more but dreams and aspirations of doing more, reaching more, and saying more. Jesus' life was surrounded by demands, by intrusions, But they never deterred him from his priority or his sense of mission. When I've studied his life, I have never gotten the impression that he ever hurried or was bothered. He was never unnerved. Never responded in a way that was out of line with his character. How did he maintain such composure? 
he must have known his limits well. Strange as it may seem, Christ knew what I can't seem to get a grip on. Time must be properly set and used for the gathering of inner strength. Busy? Yes, he was. Pressured? Oh, God, I know he was pressured. He was so consumed by the needs of people. He had no private life to speak of, except when he spent time alone. He managed very adequate amounts of time alone for the sole purpose of prayer and meditation. He knew that unless we have time set aside to be with Him, that all the hours that are spent in our schedules, all of our commitments mean absolutely nothing. They are of no value whatsoever. What will I have to offer? How can I truly give? My efforts have no meaning if your presence isn't there. We've not been adequately taught to appreciate the need for disengagement for anything other than personal leisure. So much of what we call rest today is merely amusement during a time of withdrawal to meditate it's so easy for the enemy to impulse our brains with this is really a waste of time you know this might even be on the verge of um, mental games but meditation is not a place where hidden mysteries lurk and it is certainly not idleness. May I submit to you that meditation is a vigorous discipline of the inner self. The outward man serves God, but it's the inner man that fellowships God. Mother Teresa of Calcutta had it so right when she said, Pray for me that I not loosen my grip on the hands of Jesus, even under the guise of ministry to the poor. It casts a different light on the scene. When I realize that communion in a quiet place of withdrawal is not just for me for him he calls us he waits and he wants so much to enjoy intimate fellowship with us he calls us as he did Adam and Eve we have an invitation to join him but do we hear fellowship oh what fellowship with him our fellowship may be marked with laughter and with tears, but we meet Him because he, he needs us and we need Him. Not because we need to laugh and cry, but because I have a need for Him and He hath a need for me. And so, Mickey, what day is yours? Do you retreat to restock? Hurry, noise, food, rush, poorly organized schedules. These and a thousand more strings pull at me just like they did little Jonathan. And they make my going into our secret place a chore instead of a delight. But you'll provide the power if I just take time to pray. 
time. That four letter word that haunts me. It's so significant because it's so rare. Sure, I feel the last days, the threat pressing at me. Urgency shouts at me to go after one more derelict. Find one more Kessie. Go after one more soul. Start another bus route. Help to mend a broken home. Fight back and get the territory that Satan stole from us yesterday. Yes, yes, I feel it. I hear it. It drives me. But I miss my time with you. Those moments together. I need to be with you each day. And it hurts me when you say you're too busy. Too busy. Oh God, the incessant activities we perform and perform and we act and we act until fatigue cuts our feet out from beneath us and all that he's left with is just a heap on the floor. We can't give what we don't have. Tell me how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? There's a longing in my heart. Wanting more than just a part. You amaze me, Jesus. I marvel that you want to be one with me. You only get the fragments of my time, the fragments of my energies. It's true. It's true. It's true, but I still miss my time with you. Oh, the calm and the quiet that belongs to us in our secret place. The place that serves as a twofold purpose. Me for him and him for me. Communion, pausing, thinking, listening, listening. How can two people talk at one time? And then again, maybe not a word is uttered, yet our understanding of each other and our fellowship with one another sings aloud in the silence. Once upon a time we met at our place. And oh, how he ministered unto me. I had temporarily snipped away all the strings that had me bound. I had regrouped, Phyllis. I was restored and I was satisfied. Time became of essence and I rose to leave his presence. And then I heard him say, just as I hear myself right now, stay with me. Stay with me, for I glory in your presence, just as you do in mine. I feast at your table, just as you dine with me. I need you. I beg for your attention. I bless you. Bless me. Bless me. 
I have filled your cup. Now can you attend to my thirst for you? We're too busy. We're too crowded. Me for him and him for me. When you say you're too busy, <laughs> how can you serve me when your spirit empty? There's a longing in my heart, wanting of you as I can give. It's true. It's true. It's true. one that is coming to speak to us now sounded a clear and consistent call to the years and has kept us tethered to the altar she has kept us tethered to our altar few people have more powerfully impacted so many a voice known in heaven revered in earth Open your heart and your head and listen carefully to the wife of the senior pastor of the Pentecostals, Vesta Mangan. Let's welcome her. What worms of the dust we are, and yet God hath chosen to use every one of us. What an army of Jesus' name people are in this room today. What mighty leaders, greatest preachers in the world are on this platform today. I don't know what we lack. I'm mighty glad to be here feeling what I feel. Amen. <laughs> Mickey, thank you for your excellence in every area of your life. Thank you for going beyond the call of duty. Thank you, Kenneth, for being here with me today, my other son in the gospel, whom I love dearly, a mighty preacher. Much will be accomplished in this end time, and I feel an awesome, awesome Spirit of God here today that will indeed give direction. And we will be changed. Could I ask you to join me as we raise our hands and again ask God, let God, let God, let God, every eye closed, every hand raised, without Him, without Him, without Him.
two mighty men of valor. We're 37 days into the second year of the final decade of the 20th century. We are 21 days into a bloody war in the Middle East. And yes, Mr. President, it is a defining moment in history. And we are racing the rapture. There are apocalyptic siftings and disclosures. There is a growing interest in eschatological doctrines. But it is not necessary for us to know the times and the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. What is important and vital is ye shall receive power. Right. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Right. I have that anointing. Yeah. I have that power. Yeah. Yeah. I have that divine utterance given unto me from the Holy One, and I will not waste it. Jesus imparts to me a flow, a presence that sets me apart. This presence, this dimension, endues me to witness the message of Jesus Christ to the lost. Yeah. It is inspiration beyond the natural to produce. It makes you spiritually courageous and fills you with love and compassion for the lost. There is something of another world about you. There is a touch of supernatural that attracts, that captures, that magnetizes, that convicts, that converts. Ye are the light of the world. You can never be satisfied with formality once you have experienced the anointing. Yes. There is no substitute for the anointing. It was bought with a price no pen can compute. It unties the string of my tongue. My soul cannot be mute. It was given me to witness this gospel, to heal the brokenhearted, to deliver the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. I will live by that anointing. I wouldn't trade it for any pleasure you could offer me today. I'll pay any price to sustain it. I've had very little else to go by. I'm not terribly bright, nor have I had an enormous education, but I've really learned to trust the anointing. I will not treat it as something trite. I will never waste it. You take me at my word, God. You gave it to me. I'll use it everywhere. I will not treat it as something trite, lest I be set aside instead of being set apart. It's worked for me on airplanes, street corners, places of business, in churches, in homes, anywhere. There are people, people, people. It works. I love to tell this story. It's going to be my theme in glory to tell this grand old story of Jesus and his love and when I'm dying how glad I shall be that the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee I shall not regret one thing that I gave money or time one sinner to save we have a message yes. a message for people that makes every other message in this world seem minor it's more than rhetoric and clever repertoire or meaningful cliches the gospel is the inspired announcement given by God himself to be preached and proclaimed to all men everywhere. The gospel is the power of God, the dynamic of God. It breaks the power of sin and sets men free. Bear that message one time and you will live and thrill in that moment as you have never lived or thrilled before. If we can't witness now, we never will. 
If we can't be inviters now, we never will. A world system is crumbling. It cannot govern. It's a cage of every foul and hateful bird. Its credibility is shattered. Its economy, debt ridden, is headed toward bankruptcy. Its entertainment is rubbing the gutter. Its exploits have multiplied war, divorce, crime, and addiction. But this message that you and I preach rises above the wrecks of time. It penetrates frontiers. It infiltrates society. It moves through prison walls. It leapfrogs language barrier. It confronts the lost with the same zeal as did Jesus with Zacchaeus and the woman of Samaria. In Hong Kong, standing in the customs line that was moving slowly, I began to visit with a beautiful Malaysian girl immediately in front of me. I asked her, have you ever heard of Pentecost? And she said, no, I never have heard of that. Then I asked, have you ever heard of Jesus? And she raised her little hand and measured like this and said, very little. In a dress shop in Hong Kong, I say to an employee in a dress shop, Have you ever heard of Pentecost? No. Have you ever heard of Jesus? No. My parents are Buddhist. I was born a Buddhist. But I'd really like to know. So many, so many would really like to know. And that's the wonder. That's the wonder to me of all wonders. It's the wonder that has changed the world. The great creator, the inhabitor of eternity, the ageless God manifest himself in flesh to seek, to save the lost. And we seem to know so little about it and we do even less. My subject, a revelation of the mystery of the incarnation is a must for this end time. Yes, right. The beauty of the Garden of Eden was breathtaking. Once the glories of earth and heaven met and joined there, the best of both realms touched, and the garden was the meeting place. It was there that God made man in his own image, the figure of him that was to come. It was there that angels played together and all the joys of heaven and earth were one. Then came that tragic day when man fell for the big lie. Man ran and hid himself from God. And he who had been captive by Satan would have remained forever lost had not the great creator, the ageless God, gone looking for him, calling, Adam, where art thou? But holiness and justice required that man be cast out of the garden and the door was slammed shut. And two mighty beings before whom whirled a flame of wrath and fire stood just outside the door to guard the entrance to the heavenly realm. Angels returned to their realm. The garden disappeared forever from view, but the purpose was not thwarted. Man, who was the joining of two realms, formed out of the very elements of planet sod, to whom God gave his very breath. Man, the creature composed of elements from both realms, made two rims one but the bond did not hold man fell but that fall did not thwart the purpose God in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning promised I will yet join the highest glory of heaven with the highest that earth affords I will do so in the fullness of time great is the mystery it will not be a garden where only two created beings communed with God it will not be a Noah's ark where only eight souls were saved. It will not be a tabernacle in the wilderness where only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year to feel the Shekinah glory. Great is the mystery, but in the fullness of time, our ageless God would prepare himself a body after the similitude of Adam to seek, to seek, to seek the ageless God in the form of man seeking
seeking to save the lost. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners had sought to dwell with man, to make a redemptive connection with man, to bring man back to himself, hath in the fullness of time taken man's nature that he might reach man's need. God and man became one. The God of heaven and the man of earth brought together the highest of two realms. Divinity and humanity brought oneness. Eternity time wed. Heaven and earth came together. The invisible was made visible. The eternal spirit wrapped in flesh. He who was rich yet for man's sake became poor that through his poverty he might make every man rich. He came not to be ministered unto, but He came to minister for men and to make a ransom for many. The mystery of the Incarnation is the great Creator became the Savior. Down from His glory, ever living story, my God and Savior came. Jesus was His name. Born in a manger to His own a stranger. Stooping to woo, to win, to save my soul. That would have remained forever lost. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. He was the Son of Man 100%. He was the Son of God 100%. He was Son of God. He was Son of Man, both in one and just as much Son of Man as though He were not Son of God. And just as much Son of God as though He were not Son of Man, so that He could mediate for man as well as mediate for God. Great mystery, God became became man to reach man. Man, God's masterpiece. No line can measure him. The archangel that stands before the throne of God will never outlive him. The world will burn. The sun and the moon and the stars will refuse to shine. Ages and millenniums march on. God's masterpiece will still live on forever and forever and forever somewhere. And in the light of that, and in the light of Calvary and hell and heaven and eternity, what value does this place on man? Every man and woman you meet. For the great mystery of incarnation, God became a man to reach men. From the womb of the Virgin Mary shall come forth all the essence of God. God and man at last met in one. Redemption had come. The mystery revealed. The eternal purpose for which the worlds were created was made known. No mind had ever conceived or even imagined what that purpose was until Gabriel told Mary, Call his name Jesus, for he shall save mankind from the ravages that sin has wreaked upon the human race. God became man to save man. That's the mystery of the incarnation. Don't treat that as something trite. You may can explain the awesome mystery of the mighty God in Christ to the astounding of the scholars. And we should be able to, for it is the cardinal and foundational truth of the church. But if we do not understand the purpose of the mystery of incarnation, and if we are not totally involved in seeking and saving the lost, we need a revelation! We need a revelation! And everybody shout that with me. We need a revelation of the mystery of the incarnation. That's right. God, 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 the ageless God was manifest in flesh to seek and to save the lost. The whole cosmos, the entire universe is geared to this purpose. The key to unlocking the powers of God's world for you and for me. If you want that power of God's world, you must get involved in the purpose and in the mystery of the incarnation. He which was, is, and is to come. God incarnate stopped the flaming sword with his own wounded side. Broke through the door into the visible rim to wander the corridors of time seeking and saving the lost for in all men he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save he suffered and died for all men don't treat any of them like a serial number don't stomp on them when they're down don't treat them like misfits every one of them was bought by Calvary and Calvary is a long reach forgive and forget and restore 
and quit treating one another like digital numbers and some computerized digit. Did you hear me? Then you ought to stand and say, my God, have mercy on me and forgive me. You may be seated. Every step he took, every breath he breathed, he was seeking and saving the lost. It was his meat by day and his pillow by night. It never disappeared. It never left him. He never was too busy. It led him to Pilate's judgment hall. It led him to Gethsemane. It led him to Calvary. It led him on and on. And let me tell you something. Calvary's reach is a long reach. It reaches beyond where you sometimes care to reach. Or where you even sometimes think it's reaching. Calvary just keeps on reaching. When you hear the beautiful stories that the ageless God incarnate told, the good Samaritan, the king who made a great supper, the talents, the pounds, the rich man and Lazarus, the lost coin, the lost son, the lost sheep, and you hear him speak as never a man spoke, if he lose one... If he lose one, just one, he leaveth the ninety and nine and goeth after him and he will leave us just as sure as I'm standing here and go after the lost souls while you sit in your dry, dead, plucked up by the roots churches if you're not seeking that one lost sheep. He'll leave us. You won't have any anointing. You won't have any power. You won't have any glory. He sent you to seek and to save the lost. He will leave us. He will leave the 99. He goeth after it. Somebody shout that. Goeth after it. Oh, that sounds exciting to me. He goeth after it. He goeth after it. He doesn't stop until. He doesn't stop until. He doesn't stop until. Until he finds how many. Hold up your finger. Say just one. Say just one. I'm going after what? I'm going after one. 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 It was no spasmodic hit and miss method with him. It was no off and on seasonal proposition. It was no Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. It was no spring and autumn revival matter with him. It was a persistent, persevering matter. And it was the ageless God in the form of man that I'm talking about. If one clue didn't work, he got him another clue. He went after him. The theme in every story he told and every figure of speech was this man does not belong in hell. Where the fire is not quenched and where they beg for one drop of water. Don't you sit here dry eyed during this conference. Don't you sit here like you've got it all put together. Don't you sit here like you're well housed and well clothed and saved and sanctified. We've got to go after one. We've got to go after one. We've got to go after souls. We've got to go after them. Go after them. Go after them. That's what the incarnation is all about. That's what the incarnation is all about. That's the mystery of the incarnation. Go after souls. Go after them. Man belongs in the fold. And man is worth more than a sheep. But he's lost. Has no propensity. 
cannot find his way home. He's scared of every man's face. He's got to be sought and found and loved and cuddled because man is the business of God in heaven and one, just one, is worth more than this whole world. For if you gain the whole world, go ahead and grab it and get it. It's going down in one hour. You're not going to keep none of it. Only the souls you save will be the stars in your crown if you make it. It cannot be vague. It cannot be generality. It is seeking. It is seeking. It is searching until for one coin, one son, one sheep. My brother Libby's tape in the white steeple. You never heard nothing like it. These stories and figures of speech are not for some oratorical or clever presentation. They're to be obeyed, lived out, fleshed out. You and I seeking and saving the lost. In simple terms, his message in every story and every figure of speech was this as much as lies within me I am to make Jesus Christ and his message available 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 say that to every man you don't call them let them call themselves you don't mistreat them you let them turn don't you turn them you let them turn for Jesus practiced what he preached Ask Andrew, ask Simon Peter, ask Philip, ask Nathaniel, Matthew, James, and John. Ask Nicodemus, ask the woman at the well of Samaria, ask Mary Magdalene, blind Bartimaeus, the man of Gadara. On and on is the story of the four Gospels. Jesus reaching them one by one. God incarnate, the ageless God, the mystery of the incarnation. God in the form of man, taking men alive. Read it. Taking men alive. Nothing else mattered to him. He reached for the Pharisees. He reached for the Sadducees. He reached for the harlots. He reached for the outcasts, the beggars, the halt, the blind, the lame, the physically handicapped, the hard pressed parents. He reached for little children. He took babies in his arms and blessed them. Hear me? Did you hear me? He took time for babies. Did you hear me? He took time for little children and you don't want to pay out anything to get them in your church. He took time for them. Every human being mattered to him. When dying on the cross, he said to the penitent thief, come and go home with me. He took the worst derelict sin could produce and made beautiful saints out of them. He wept over that ill-fated city of Jerusalem, the incarnate one, Emmanuel, God with us, beseeching, entreating, weeping, calling, come, hearken, incline, seek ye, call upon me, return, come, let us reason together, calling, Adam, where art thou? The great creator, incarnate in flesh, praying, fasting, weeping, seeking and saving the lost. Say, that's incredible. Say it again. Say, the ageless God in the form of a man, seeking and saving the lost. Say, that's incredible. Say, that's the revelation that I've got to get a hold of. My great and mighty God. That's the revelation. I've got to get a hold of that. Say, He left me an example that I should follow in His steps. Does anybody here understand me? Does anybody here understand me? I don't believe you understand me. I know this, if Jesus Christ is so vitally concerned with seeking and saving the lost, and we call ourselves Christians, there can be no acceptable alternative to our being a soul winner and making disciples. They were first called Christians at Antioch. They didn't call themselves Christians. They were called Christians. Why? Because they patterned Him. He's the pattern for us all. He's the blueprint of of what he wants to accomplish in every Christian. Listen, he's calling in this room today. Follow me. Follow me. I'm the God incarnate in flesh, seeking and saving the lost. And you call yourself a Christian? 
I'm afraid many of us would shudder to see the hideous sight if we could see ourselves compared with his life. If he should come today and find I had not told one soul about the way, what would I say? But then more importantly, what do you think he would say? Yeah, yeah. Does it count for naught that between his resurrection and ascension, the 40 days that shook the world, over and over again, Jesus enunciated his commission, go, teach, preach, baptize in my name among all nations. I'll go with you even unto the end. And he has and he will and he is. Jesus told them, ye are the salt of the earth. And the purpose of salt is to save. But if you lose your saltiness, you are good for nothing. Turn to your neighbor and say, if I lose my saltiness, I'm good for nothing. Whether you believe it or not, you're good for nothing. Whether you believe it or not, you're good for nothing. Whether you believe it or not, we're not going to pat you on the back and tell you you're doing good and well done. If you lose your saltiness and penetration and ability to save, you're good for nothing. Say cast out. Say trodden underfoot. Trodden underfoot of men. That's where we'll get. Everybody else will walk all over us. Did you hear me? Everybody else will walk all over us. If you want to sit there pious and fold your hands, you ought to have been on your feet. And I say that humbly. But if I'm telling you the truth, somebody ought to have stood up and said, My God, it's the truth. It hasn't got a hold of us. You may be seated. Brother Tenney said, just get a little plainer. I know what he's telling me. He can work me over later. But right now, I'm in the pulpit and I'm anointed. God hates barrenness. God hates barrenness. Emptiness. Be it salt or a fig tree, throw it out. Walk on it. Cut it down. Good for nothing. That scares me to death. That frightens me. Now you can sit there and fold your hands and think because you're a teacher or a preacher or a song leader. That scares me to death. Say cast out. Everybody else are walking on me and are trotting on me and are spewing me out of their mouth and are chewing me up. No! Uh-uh. They ain't going to walk on me. I ain't going to be thrown out. I'm not going to be trodden underfoot. No, ma'am. I'm salt. I'm the salvation. I'm the penetration. I'm the captivation. I'm the domination. Before you're seated, said, I, I, I'm going to be good for something. I'm going after them. Be seated. Thank you. Twelve electrified men with a mission and a message. Twelve electrified men. Say electrified. Get your hands out and act like you got it anyhow. seated. Brother Libby, you keep standing. Tell me in a few short words what struck you as a dope addict when you walked in that Pentecostal church. There's a little wow. sister that knew how to shout. Make your voice up like mine. <laughs> when I walked in there, there was a little old lady who had the Holy Ghost like, Woo! When she did that, something went all over me. I knew I was in the right place.
tell me, Jeff, in three or four words what moved into your room one night and how it went. Oh. Say it loud. Lift up your voice like mine. I'm on the way to divorce. Nobody witnessed to me. Nobody talked to me. The presence woke me up. Presence. Said you have a few days to get your life straight. Yeah. I'm real. Yeah. I went among you holy rollers. And I found God. Yeah. Mighty men now. Say mighty preachers. Some of the greatest among us on this platform and around this front. You may be seated. Say, say those 12 men did it. Now it's history. Not with the accoutrements of litany and decorum and eloquence and magnificent speech. Their secret was a 10-day prayer meeting, a sound, a sound, the same sound that Samuel heard when he ran the Philistines off. And they never came back no more when they heard that sound. That same sound that with his hand he wrote on the wall and Belshazzar's knees smote one another. I want that sound. You can take what you want. I want that sound. I'm going to have that sound. You may be seated. Say, I want that sound. In every service. Cloven tongues. Like as a fire. I want it. I can have it. I'm going to have it. I will have it. Set out upon each. Not just the Mangans and the Tinnies and the Urshans and the Kilgores and a few others up here. Say it's out upon each. Say I want fire. God use fire. From the very beginning, fire. I want the fire burning in me and it'll never go out. Give me fire till I cross over the line and let all the trumpets sound. She kept the fire. They changed their world with that fire. The church grew and the disciples multiplied. Let me say it again and again and again and again. It began with prayer. It began with prayer. It began with prayer. You ain't going nowhere without it. Care what your accoutrements are. You're going to sit there dried up while he talked about the declension of all of these other churches. This church is going to rise. And if you'll go with us and come on and take a hold of this, she'll be the dominating force in this earth before it's all over. Thank you, Bob, for being here today. Mighty man you are. Walk on. Go on. Preach on. Sing on. Say, keep the fire burning. Whatever else we do will result in barrenness if we fail to be a praying church and a going church. That's why Satan will do everything he can to keep people from praying. Because prayer shackles him and his bands of hellish demons. Did you hear me? Prayer unleashes the mighty power of heaven. Prayer looses the angelic host to do their work on earth. Work of deliverance and salvation. Prayer bombs the spiritual targets of Satan, forcing him to retreat in desperation. Prayer changes the destinies of nations. Prayer breaks the spell over individual lives, setting them free. Prayer is the exertion of authority in the invisible war that rages even now. Prayer pleases God because it brings victory to the cause of Christ. Say, begin with prayer. Because when Zion travails, when Zion travails, when Zion travails, children are born. You can't argue with that, ma'am. Sir, preacher, church, you can't argue with that. When Zion travails, children are born. And where is concern for the lost in the church and in the pulpit today? Say the church and the pulpit. Where is that seeking and compassionate note? 
I cannot remember when I have seen a congregation bowed before God, weeping, weeping. A whole congregation. A whole congregation. Bowed. Weeping in paroxysms. Seizures of agony. I cannot remember when I've ever seen that. Because they wept and wept and wept. Have you ever seen that? Has anybody here ever seen a whole congregation in travail weeping for the burden of the lost? Can you remember when you saw that? Does anybody want to answer me? I didn't hear a word. The agonizing for souls has left us. You're quiet. You're quiet. The agonizing of souls for souls has left us. Praying in the Holy Ghost with groanings that cannot be uttered has left us. Ah. But it does not change the doctrine for as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. A nation will be born in a day. She's over there now, but she's waiting to be born spiritually. It'll happen in a day. For when Zion travails, a nation will be born in a day. Look out. It will happen just as sure as I'm standing here. Right. Without travail, people are not born into the kingdom of God. Now the whole earth groaneth in travail to be delivered. Zion, we must enter into the pangs of travail to effect their deliverance. For if we saw a travail in a church bowing before God, burdened for the lost, what would you see? Tears, agony, intercession, supplication, praying in the Holy Ghost, howling, mourning, lamenting, weeping, refusing to be comforted. Say that. How many of you are comforted with your children lost and your neighbors lost and the world lost? Then rise up here today and say, I refuse to be comforted. I refuse to stop. I refuse to quit. I refuse to be comforted. I refuse to be comforted. I refuse to cease. I refuse to stop. Say until. Until. Souls are saved from hell. You may be seated. I know not by what methods rare, but this I know, God answers prayer. Because of the times, humbly I tell you, until we see the church in travail, our nation will be lost. Our state will be lost. Our city will be lost. Our families could well be lost. And human souls will be lost. That causes me to bow in travail. Paul bowed in such travail that he said, I could wish myself accursed from Christ, for my brethren, for my kinsmen according to the flesh how many of us have ever prayed that and you call yourself a Christian and don't pray and win souls let me tell it to you you're a counterfeit you're a hypocrite Jesus Christ say Christ Christian came at great cost to seek and to save the lost and he said we're to do the same thing it's a command our mission is still the great commission winning the lost is every Christian's responsibility and if it's every Christian's responsibility it definitely is every minister's responsibility the New Testament blueprint for evangelism is everybody win one that's the New Testament blueprint. That's not because of the Times blueprint. No. That's the New Testament blueprint. Everybody win one. Say it. Everybody. Thus every activity of the church is to be geared to soul winning. Leaders in the church are first soul winners, then leaders. Teachers in this church are first soul winners before they're capable of teaching. Ushers, choir members are first soul winners before they're anything. A church that has no soul winning ministry is only half a church half a church half a church half a church the sin of sins is the sin of not winning souls now you want to knock it down the sin of sins is not winning souls heaven's verdict is high treason and criminal negligence little wonder many of our prayers are not getting answered how can disobedient Christians guilty of the sin of sins expect answered prayers prayer isn't a filibuster you can't use prayer as a smoke screen a cover up for obedience you can't pray over disobedience and backbiting and prejudice and destroying one another and revealing everything you can and the indifference and 
the cowardice and the dishonesty and the hypocrisy. You can't substitute prayer for repentance and obedience. God is under no obligation to do things just because we ask. Obedience comes first. We need more prayer right now than we've ever needed in all of our lives. If we don't pray now, we never will with our boys in Saudi and with this world crumbling. But we need prayers, couplets. We need prayer and humbling ourselves. Prayer and fasting. Prayer and the Word. Prayer and confessing our faults. Prayer and intercession. Prayer and praise. We need answers to prayers. But Jesus said, if any man will do my will, obey my commission, he shall know. So there's only one thing left for us to do is to repent. Nobody in here wants to do that, but just say it anyhow. Repent. repent. Say, I haven't won a soul. Say it. So I need to repent. Say, I haven't won a soul. I've never taught a Bible study. I haven't won one soul, so I need to repent. Easy going, lukewarm, unconcerned, uncommitted lives to the Great Commission. It'll be repent of all of that. Say, or we'll perish. Admit that we haven't won souls. Admit that we haven't carried out the Great Commission. Then get up off our knees and say, go do it. Say, go do it. That's what David told his mighty leader. He said, now go do it. Go get after it. I've given you the orders. Now go do it. Then maybe we'll get answers to all these prayers we've been praying. We've got to get up from here and go do something. John Knox prayed, God give me Scotland or I die. Are you tired of hearing that? John Hudson Taylor said, the sun has never risen upon China without finding me at prayer. You don't want to hear that anymore? John Hyde was known to spend 36 hours on his knees without moving and often without saying anything audibly, interceding before God for India. And we call ourselves Oneness Pentecostal, Jesus' name. George Whitfield prayed, give me souls or take my soul. Doddridge could say, I long for the conversion of souls more than life. Matthew Henry said, if I could win one soul, it would mean greater happiness than mountains of silver or gold. Charles Spurgeon preached to great multitudes with great power and eloquence and biblical knowledge. Thousands responded because below, on a lower level, hundreds were praying while he preached because he considered the reaching of the lost was so important. Let me tell it to you today and don't forget this. One man totally committed to the Great Commission is an awesome weapon in the hands of God. Anybody want to accept that? Anybody want to accept that? Then, I, then you'll be a mighty weapon. You'll be a mighty awesome weapon in the hands of God. You'll be a mighty awesome weapon in the hands of God. You may be seated. God manifested in the flesh, spent days and nights in prayer. The mystery of the incarnation, the ageless God in a man spending days and nights in prayer. And we call ourselves Christians, launched his ministry of 40 days of prayer and fasting, refused to go forth to teach or to preach until he had prayed, made no great decisions until he had spent the night in prayer, spent the night in prayer before choosing his disciples, rising a great while before every day to go to a solitary place to pray his disciples said the zeal of his house hath eaten him up O Lord teach us to pray he told Peter Peter I'm praying for you so prayer must work he ever liveth to intercede for me so prayer must work and you can come boldly to the throne he said so prayer must work are you a Christian and you're not praying are you really a Christian in this room today is there a Christian among us for if we are not praying and seeking and saving the lost. That's why churches are not growing. Many disintegrating and declining and dying. For where there is no vision, the people... I didn't hear you finish it. Then if it's perish, then we've got to keep that vision and with no organized, concerted effort of praying and reaching the lost, say we perish. Say book of numbers. Say there's a book in the Bible called Numbers. Say numbers. Don't tell me God's not interested in numbers. Don't tell me that there's a book in the Bible called Numbers. 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 Israel was numbered twice. Shortly after leaving Egypt and just before going into Canaan. 
She numbered 1,800 fewer 40 years later because instead of conquering, they began to wonder. And while we've rested in our respectability without vision, without compassion, zeal, and enthusiasm, we are wasting our daylight hours complacently, holding our own as snug as a bug in a rug. But while we sit here well housed, well clothed, well fed, our generation is stampeding their way to hell. We do not well this day. We sit around claiming to be confused and don't know what's right and don't know what's wrong and the harvest is wasting. I challenge you to tell me you don't know what's right and wrong. You have many policemen. One is your own conscience. Nearly 1,400 churches, United Pentecostal churches, gave less than $1,000 to foreign missions last year. 11% gave zero nothing. 10% gave half of all that's given. And 18 families are on hold to go. And yet the Holy Ghost is a missionary spirit. Don't tell me we're doing well. We are indicted. And if it takes me to say it, I will say it. We are indicted before God. So we're confused. We're confused. Humbly but pungently. Let me say it to you. If you're not totally committed in the Great Commission, everything you do is wrong. Everything. Don't be accusing nobody else. You're wrong. If you're not involved in the Great Commission. Sin is not in pleasure. Now, I'll just stop there and let you hang on to that a minute. Sin is in priority. Nothing must come before God. That is the first law of the earth. It is the first law of eternity. And it will be God's first law. God must have first place in your life. Say first place. Say it again until it gets a hold of us. Say first place. I don't care you beautiful singers. Say he's got first place. When you're too busy to take time with him. And when so, say you're too busy. We must determine, yes, Mr. President, in this defining hour, what is important, and then concentrate our efforts in that direction. It's not what we are doing, it's what we are not doing. If we were doing what we ought to be doing, we wouldn't have any questions about what we ought not to be doing. The problem, we haven't apprehended that which has apprehended us. It hasn't got a hold of us, and we don't have a hold of it. It's not down in our innermost being. It's not like fire shut up in our bones. It's not like rivers flowing, spontaneous, automatic, second nature. If it were, we couldn't help but speak the things we've seen and heard. See the harvest! See the harvest! The harvest is ripe. You can't win souls now. You never will. Paul said on the Damascus turnpike, God appeared unto me to make me a minister and a witness of these things. I stripped for the race. I counted all things as dung. I kept one eye on the judgment and the other on the lost world. Stoned at Lystra, imprisoned at Philippi, whipped at Jerusalem, debated and discounted at Athens. I just preached on because necessity necessity was laid on me. And a dispensation of the gospel was committed to me. And woe is me if I preach it not. Regions beyond kept calling me. I became all things to all men to win some. I determined to go to Rome even if it meant my death. I snatched souls out of Caesar's palace. In prison my guards didn't stand a chance. Out of prison I covered Asia in less than three years weeping in their streets and from house to house. I finished my assignment. I looked at all of them and said my hands are free from the blood of every one of you. I'll meet you at the judgment. That's what Paul felt when he tramped Asia. That's what Paul felt when he tramped Asia and Europe. He was committed to one proposition. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. He knew he carried life and death. It was his awesome responsibility. It made a giant out of the Saul of Tarsus. What will you, with the same mission and message, answer at the judgment seat of Christ? You can't dismiss this great commission with a shrug of the shoulders or the washing of your hands. Ask Pilate. He didn't do so well with it. Paul said, if you've got a wife and you're confused, be as though you had none. Weep as though you wept not. Rejoice as though you rejoiced not. Is this wrong or is that wrong? Paul said, this is so important that let this world don't abuse it. It passeth away. It is so incredibly short. And you better give all you've got to this. 
because of the times 1991 churches can and must have revival now souls can be reached and saved say now, now. say husbands can be saved now. children can be delivered now. cities can be reached now. churches can be built now. altars can be filled now. don't stay there four months and then come at the harvest God is waiting on us The calendar is his business. You just let a few among us make up their minds regardless of what others may think or do and go God's way and get a church in travail. Say, get a church in travail. And get going into the highways and byways proclaiming the gospel and things are going to change among us because you'll make the difference. Say, we'll make the difference if we'll get a church in travail and hit the streets and go into the byways and say, we can't take property. Houses, land, stocks, and bonds with us. Say only people. Say people. Say people. Yet we become gung-ho for material assets. It's time to face up to our own failures. Start doing the things we know should be done. Daniel said, I served under four illustrious, powerful kings. Saw their splendor, pomp, grandeur, and glory of their kingdoms. None of it moved me because the wise are going to shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and forever. I've made up my mind. I'm going to win souls Daniel said take all your kingdoms your pomp your glory your grandeur your splendor I'm going to be a soul winner you may be seated the wise man said it and it will forever be true he that went of souls is the wisest among among us. He that went of souls is the wisest one among us. Wednesday, January the 16th, 1991, America declared war on Iraq. 30 minutes before church started in Alexandria, the news hit this church. It was communion service night in Alexandria. Sixteen to eighteen hundred people had been served communion. With the same usual solemnity, our pastor stood right on these steps and looked over the vast audience and asked, Has anyone been missed? Has anyone here tonight been missed? Raise your hands while others stood there with the cup and the bread in their hands. In the imagery of my mind, it gripped me so. I heard a man in my mind stand to his feet and he voiced the pleas of many people and I heard him say, we live in a poor burial in the Philippines and children are crying from hunger. But even deeper than that hunger, that food cannot fill. Please, Pastor Anthony Mangan, do not pass by me without sharing the bread of life with me and my family. He sat down and immediately in my mind a lady stood and said, I too have been missed, Pastor Anthony Mangan of the Pentecostals of Alexandria. I am a government official. I am very devout. Yet when I kneel at the feet of a wooden cross in a glass coffin, I feel so empty. My religion has asked me to crawl on my knees from the streets up to the altar, but no answers ever come to me. Don't tell me about the cross and candles. I already know them well. But my heart cries to know the living Christ that you speak of so beautifully and so well. Then another one stood and said in my mind, I heard them, Please hear me also, pastor of that big church in Alexandria. I am an Iraqi and I know that you can't come to my people now. But we thirst for the atonement of which you have so freely drunk. And you've preached about tonight and how I wish you had told me when you could have told me. I've been missed! And then another one stood and spoke for the Buddhists who are trapped as the girl in the dying fray shop in Hong Kong. 
not my choice but my birth I sincerely desire to study other religions yet where do I go I've been missed someone else stood of his family in a big city in America and there was no church there I've been missed another where there is a church but no one knows about it I've been missed another told of going to church but no one seemed to care whether they were there or not didn't even reach out to them because of the way they looked so I've been missed many of our American boys had not been reached and I wondered in that moment if even we had discipled our own boys well enough before they were deployed and a new meaning and a deepened appreciation gripped me and was heavy on my soul and I knew as we know here today that if Jesus' blood was truly shed for everyone and the gospel is to be made available to the whole world and if God is not willing that any should perish we dare not deny even one in 91 the chance to know him well. Lost millions are crying out yes preachers and workers at because of the times you've missed us and we stand today crying we've been missed we've been missed we've been missed how can they hear without a preacher necessity is laid upon us a dispensation is committed unto us woe is unto us if we preach not the gospel there is blood on our hands don't treat this as something trite as a mere profession William Booth said we are moral scavengers netting the very sewers we want all we can get even to the lowest of the low David Livingston that notorious missionary to Africa his left arm was limp and useless crushed by an African lion buried his beloved wife Mary under a tree after he had suffered 30 attacks of that deadly fever but they found him dying on his knees Polycarp said 86 years even at the flaming stake I'll not quit witnessing for him I've done it for 36 years I'm not going to quit now I'm just going to preach on John Bunyan author of Pilgrim's Progress when the warden of Bedford prison offered to free him if he would refrain from preaching he answered let me out of here today and I'll preach the gospel in the streets of London tomorrow crying in the streets of Alexandria Baton Rouge New Orleans Shreveport, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. I was hungry, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was naked, you clothed me not. I was sick, you visited me not. I was in prison, you came to me not. Lord, when saw we thee hungry, thirsty, naked, sick, in prison, lonely, I was that lowly family in your church. I was that ethnic you disdained. I was that black man you didn't want. I was that handicapped person that was too much trouble for you to help. I was that cripple that you were not even courteous to. I was that deaf and dumb couple you were too busy to help. There was not even a ministry prepared for me. I was that blind boy walking across the street and you didn't even stop to help. I was that epileptic you mocked and shunned and despised. I was that dirty little boy you didn't want to bother with. I was that wealthy suburban socialite lonely needing a friend. I was that sinful degenerate you were too good to rub shoulders with. You had no time to give. You had no love. You had no bread, no water to share. I came. Oh! the many times I came I was incarnated the mighty God the ageless God incarnated in flesh I came the many times I came but you didn't know me because I was the king whom you never recognized because I came in the guise of a person the mystery of the incarnation you never really had a revelation of my incarnation mystery you never knew me you never took time to know me in the guise of a person depart from me because you were never a part of me thou wicked and slothful servant you never mentioned Jesus to me you helped me not the light to see you met me every day you could tell by looking that I was astray, but you never mentioned Jesus to me. So when in a better land before the bar you stand, how deeply grieved your soul's going to be 
when the many lost ones there are going to cry out in deep despair. You never mentioned Jesus to me. I've got to stand by Evangeline Booth, William Booth's daughter, before she was 20 years old, hit the streets of London, flung herself, I have her story right here, you ought to read all of that, flung herself between two fighting men that were killing one another, said, this is not the way out, men. One ran, the other one bleeding. She drug him home to her dingy apartment, restored him to health, brought him to the Christ of Calvary. There's room for everybody here today. There's a place to stand for everybody here. You make up your mind whether you will or not, for you never mentioned him to me. going to do this for us. We've cried and cried and cried and cried. We've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. We've preached and preached and preached and preached. It's time to make up your mind here and now. I'm going after souls. I'm going after souls. You met me day by day. You never, you never really knew me. You never really understood the incarnation. You never really understood the incarnation. You never really understood the incarnation. You never knew the mystery. It was never revealed. You helped me not You didn't know I was in that little cripple boy, did you? Oh, degenerate, did oh, you? you met me. You didn't know me. But you knew. You never took time to know me because you know me. You know me more than yes, just in prayer. You know me in working with another person. Christ and how was it with my son? I was in the guise of another person. You met me every day. Coffee shop. 
barber shop, dress shop, grocery store, on the plane, in the car, in the home. 